Welcome everyone to today's QEDC webinar. I am Celia Mertzbacher. I'm executive director of the QEDC. And um, we're very excited to be starting a new program um, at QEDC called, that we're calling Quantum Marketplace. And I'm sorry, trying to turn around so I can uh, get the view I need, thanks. Um, so just uh, to sort of set the stage today and good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, QEDC's mission is to grow the quantum industry and supply chain and to help all of our members succeed. We have over 150 members today, about 110 of them are corporate members, uh, all sizes and shapes. Um, so we're looking for ways going <coughs> to connect users in the research and commercial sectors and developers of new QIST systems with the members who can solve problems and su supply the right component for the job. And so today we're kicking off this quantum marketplace, which we plan to make a monthly webinar series that showcases a handful of QEDC member companies from various parts of the supply chain. And today we're focusing on lasers. Um, we have some planned for next, the next couple of months, but um, we're excited to, to be starting this activity and we look forward to hearing comments from those of you who are uh, attending today. So um, I just have a couple of points that I wanted to make first. One is that um, we wanna make connections. That's really the objective of this event. However, um, we generally don't share email lists with even within the QEDC. That's our current policy. Given that this is a QEDC member only event, what we plan to do is to provide the presenters with a list of who's attended names and affiliations to the best of our ability. And so if your name does not appear on your screen, I ask you to go in and rename yourself so that we can capture that. We'd like to know who's attending. This is all within the membership. Um, we could provide also emails, but right now that's not our intent. And what I'm asking you to do is to put yourself in the position of the presenters. It's understandable that they wanna be able to follow up perhaps. Um, if you think that a better policy would be for us to be willing within QEDC to share email addresses, then please chat Mary privately and let her know. But um, our, our current preference is to not give out email addresses, but if a presenter sees someone on the attendee list that they would like to be put in touch with, we're happy to make an e-intro after the event. Hold on, let me just figure out. Can I say you have a say question, Nolan? Hi. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to. Oh no, I got it. Never mind. All good. Okay. Um, so the format that we're going to follow with these webinars is to have presentations by today five presenters. Each presenter will make a short presentation, about five minutes, up to five minutes, uh, followed by a moderated Q and A with Mark Whippich. That will be about four minutes, and then we have sort of a minute for transition. So we're going to march through these fairly quickly. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, the the questions will be directed to the speaker immediately following their presentation. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and, and kick off the program. I'm gonna hand it over to Mark to introduce the speakers today. These are the companies that uh, we're gonna be showcasing. I will add right now that we are recording this event. Our plan is to edit the individual presentations into spotlight videos, these five minute videos that we can put up on the member website and on the public website to give greater visibility to the members who are presenting. As I say, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about the upcoming uh, webinars that you can look forward to. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark. I'll leave this slide up as you make the intro. Thank you, Celia. So, so we have five companies joining us today. Uh, we have a number of other laser companies in the QDC membership that uh, you know, expressed interest as well. Um, you know, we'll be, you know, doing this again. The plan is to do this again later. So 
We may see some of these companies again. We may see uh, quite a few new companies in the QDC membership as well. So, so today we have Coherent. Uh, we have Dirk Mueller, who's head of strategic marketing at Coherent. Uh, we have Photodyme, John Spencer, president and CEO. And we have Scott Davis from Besson, who's the CEO. We also have Mark Tolbert from Toptica, who's president and CEO of the US division. And then we have from Freedom Photonics, Steven Nestrella, who's the quantum tech and apps leader there. So with that, I think we should start with Dirk. And for the speakers, um, we don't want to interrupt your presentation. We know you're gonna end in five minutes. I'm gonna turn off my video and I will turn my video back on when you have about 30 seconds. And that way um, we're not gonna interrupt your presentation, but hopefully you'll see that as a signal that you have about 30 seconds to go. Thank you. Thank you, Celia, for organizing this. And also thanks to Scott and Mark for inviting us and allowing us to be part of this. I am Dirk Mueller. I'm with Coherent. And Coherent sees itself as a photonics solutions provider. So we provide a whole different array of different components and lasers, as well as up to subsystems and turnkey systems for photonics industry. And we see ourselves uh, acting in four different market segments. That's how we view the world in these four segments. And that's precision manufacturing, microelectronics, uh, anything that would go into a mobile device, for example, bioinstrumentation, life sciences, as well as aerospace and defense. And three of these areas actually touch on quantum technology the one that doesn't perhaps is the precision manufacturing. And Coherent has been active in the quantum community for quite some time. So we have a number of different laser systems that serve the quantum community. And um, five minutes is too short to talk about all of them, but I wanna highlight a few here and then go into depth on one specific one. So these are some examples of lasers from Coherent that are currently being used for quantum technology. The Paladin is a um, quasi-CW laser that goes up to uh, several watts at 355. And it finds mostly applications in uh, ion trapping, for example. Many of you know uh, about uh, stabilized lasers uh, that use, that have in the heart of it, a tapered amplifier. So it's a diode that's amplified with a tapered amplifier. Uh, we oftentimes are actually the source of those tapered amplifiers that you find in other vendors' laser systems. Then we have a Mephisto that's a CW, very stable laser. Um, it is fixed in wavelength, um, but it has very high power. And it's been used, for example, in some of the gravitational wave experiments uh, that you might have seen in the news. And another category is the diodes and volume bracket gratings that we sell. These are more the component level, and they have been purchased by customers who are uh, doing quantum science. So I could talk about any of these in detail, but the one architecture that I would like to highlight in this webinar today I actually optically pumped semiconductor lasers. And as the name implies, they're optically pumped instead of electronically pumped. At the heart, they're still a semiconductor laser. So you have your semiconductor epi layers um, that uh, other uh, semiconductor lasers are also have. And so in these layers, you have quantum welds. And uh, instead of having it energized electrically, you shine a pump light onto this stack and the pump light is absorbed in this semiconductor layer. And then you have actually an external mirror to make the cavity. And having this external mirror then obviously allows you to do some fine tuning on wavelengths and so on. And uh, the whole thing looks something like this here on the right-hand side where you have your, your chip on a heat sink and then the pump comes in at an angle, which is kind of convenient. And you can even have a nonlinear crystal inside to do frequency doubling or frequency tripling. And uh, the biggest differentiator perhaps between this type of architecture and a standard semiconductor laser is the power levels that you can achieve. So let me talk, uh, say a few words about the wavelength range. So, the fundamental, these uh, lasers 
range from about 920 to 1180 nanometers. That's the native wavelength. And then of course you can frequency double, intracavity, frequency double, or you can frequency triple, and that allows you to um, reach some other wavelength ranges. Uh, we are actually working right now on expanding the native wavelength range, as you can see here in the shaded area. We're looking to access uh, down to about 700 nanometers. And then of course, when you frequency double and frequency triple, that then fills out kind of the spectral range between the UV and the IR. And perhaps the most uh, well-known implementation of this type of technology is actually the Verdi. Some of you guys might be familiar with the Verdi laser. It's been around for a number of years. I remember buying one in 19, 95 as a graduate student to pump a TISAF, and people are still buying abilities to pump TISAF. Um, and uh, those have been around for quite some time and uh, are really industry proven. So in summary, Coherent has been serving the quantum community for a number of decades, uh, both on the scientific side, as, but as well also now on, um, on the more commercial side where companies that are engaged in quantum technologies are purchasing laser systems from us. We have fortunately a relatively broad range of different technologies that we can leverage in order to build specific lasers. And we would love to engage with customers on your opportunities and um, you know, hopefully help you go to scale and uh, reduce the size, reduce cost and um, leverage reliability. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Dirk. Um, so a few questions and please, if anyone has a question, please provide it in the chat window. Um, but so, so Coherent actually has been providing laser sources for quantum research markets for a long time, right? That's correct. Obviously, predominantly it has been in the scientific sector, but now we're also providing these sources to some of the commercial entities. Uh, now, there are not a lot of products out there, as we all know, uh, for that are in the quantum technology, but uh, there is a, there's quite a few numbers of companies that have fantastic uh, funding and are really on a great path for either quantum computing or quantum sensing or clock technologies. Right, right. And, and so a couple of things that, that came to mind uh, as you were speaking, but one, one thing would be, you know, uh, so you sort of answered my second question, but when you, when you talked about your optically pumped lasers, um, maybe go back to that just for a second. I think, I think a lot of people might find this interesting. I mean, I, for example, did not know you were doing optically pumped semiconductor lasers. Um, you talked about having power scalability and power is in the quantum, uh, you know, laser ecosystem for enabling quantum in, in many applications, power becomes a major issue, right? That's uh, right. And so, you know, what, without going, you know, we're not gonna try to boil the ocean here on this question, but, you know, what kind of power levels are, you know, do you think you can achieve in some of the interesting wavelengths that keep coming up where, you know, customers need more power? I think a lot of people might wanna know that. So on the more common wavelengths that we've been working on for quite some time, we're on the tens of watts that we can achieve even at the harmonics. So for example, the Verdi is in that range where the fundamental is uh, you know, close to 50 watts or so. Uh, on the more exotic wavelength where we have to tune the semiconductor material, we're probably more in the couple watt range, but there are ways of scaling power and it's really, about understanding the epi that you're doing for the semiconductor. And we, we do the epi ourselves. So we're in a position to refine these systems depending on a specific wavelength and then uh, scale up the power. Uh, so I would say uh, in most wavelengths, um, just below a watt or several watts is certainly feasible. Are any of those going to be in, in small swap packages or is it all going to be Verde size? It's a very good question. So I had to make a trade-off here. So should I show the Verde picture of a laser that everybody knows 
or should I show the small package? Actually, these packages can be quite small. Um, okay, so, so right, so I, I, yeah, sorry to cut you off, but we're, we got to move to the next presentation. But I think the important point here, the takeaway point is, uh, you know, people in the webinar here uh, or customers, they should definitely inquire with you uh, if they have some of the requirements, right? Would be great. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. And Dirk, maybe you can take the question in the chat offline. Will do. Thanks. Yes, Santanu had an OPO question for you. Okay, so Photodyne, John Spencer is up. Thank you very much, Mark. And Celia, you have my slides. Yeah, but you're gonna you were gonna present your slides, right? We have them as a backup. Do you prefer I can do the presenting if you like? We can do it. We can do it. It's no problem, John. Okay, I was expecting you to uh Yep. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead, Celia. Yep. Very good. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mark, Celia, and uh, we're very pleased to be with you here today talking about our products. I see that we have a number of customers that are attending the audience, and for that, I thank you. And for those of you who don't know our products, I uh, will uh, introduce you to them today. Uh, it all starts with the gain meeting. And Celia, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, Orderdyne is a vertically integrated company with our in-house wafer fab offering chip to fab, chip to package solutions. And on the right there, you see a, a graphic of our DDR laser uh, uh, product. It's about two millimeters long, quarter of a millimeter wide, and is truly designed for quantum. It is a single frequency laser with, with line widths uh, on the order of several hundred kilohertz or less. Uh, it's tunable with a, about a two nanometer tuning range without a mode hop. And it's a monolithic integrated device capable of producing up to several hundred milliwatts, depending on the wavelength at, uh, at the specific uh, uh, transition is necessary. It's used by researchers today worldwide and it's scalable for OEMs tomorrow. And it's that scalability, that semiconductor scalability that will enable OEM products for the future. On the next slide, we introduce uh, Photodyne DBR lasers as a platform technology supporting a quantum platform of, of uh, clocks, magnetometers, gravimeters, communications, and computers. There's something like over 100 wavelengths ranging from the uh, vacuum UV to the mid IR that have been proposed for uh, uh, and used for quantum applications, uh, probing quantum transitions. Uh, that's, that may be suitable for an R&D application, but uh, as products develop, there's gotta, gotta be some down selection of those wavelengths. And we see specifically three pillars uh, supporting the quantum technology. And those pillars would be 369 nanometers for the ytterbium ion, 780 nanometers of the rubidium D2 line and 852 nanometers, the cesium D2 line as being the primary uh, uh, workhorses here uh, supported by a number of other uh, wavelengths. Those other wavelengths are shown on those term diagrams and uh, for many applications in order to probe the complete physics package, you do need uh, wavelengths such as 776, 778, uh, other applications may require 935, uh, and uh, we can do all of those within our wavelengths range using the standard photodyne DBR architecture. In addition, we, we produce devices such as uh, 808, which can be used for frequency doubling for 404, and some of those other blue wavelengths that, that support those, uh, some of those other uh, uh, gallium nitride type wavelengths. The 369 is not a product at this point, but it's on our roadmap for future development. And we see that is very key for, for uh, subsequent uh, work. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see a, uh, our market-driven product development uh, over the years. We introduced our first 780 nanometer lasers for uh, rubidium and metastable helium in 2007. And uh, over the years, because we are a fundamental laser producer, able uh, to do, uh, produce devices with our specific wavelengths, 
out of our fab, we, we have increased our uh, scale of products. We have over 40 wavelengths within that quantum range that we've delivered over the years. Uh, we've introduced higher powers, several hundred milliwatts of single frequency power at, uh, at depending on the wavelengths. Uh, we've produced multiple package types and uh, several years ago, we interest, introduced our extended mode hop device, which has the two nanometer tuning range without a mode hop. Uh, we've got devices that operate at high temperatures, and we have a very active roadmap going forward for uh, further support of our customers. And on the next slide, we give you an introduction of uh, our support strategy. Uh, Obviously, in today's environment, the web is a very important part of our support strategy. And you'll see that uh, you, on our website, you can see uh, uh, applications notes, uh, product data sheets, and other information. Uh, one of these days, we'll be back to trade shows. Hopefully, in 2022, we'll be back there doing our worldwide march of trade shows. And uh, we're always supported by our sales and applications team. Bob Davis, our Vice President of Sales, Esther Moreno, our Inside Sales Manager, and Annie Zhang, our Director of Product. And I'm sure as, as uh, our customers know, you know these individuals and you've talked to them and they're always ready, standing by to, uh, to support your needs. We have distributors in key international markets and we are a charter member of the QEDC. I, and I'll, I'll close out by saying that uh, every device that we ship out for quantum uh, for a specific transition is certified to be on that transition and uh, sealed and certified by our director of products, Annie Zhang. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, John. Um, so uh, I had some questions here prepared, but one question came up in the chat and, and I know you, can you, Celia, can you go back to the wavelengths? Yeah, so you have uh, the 369 um, under development. Um, I, I, I heard you say that it's, 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 it's early days there, but uh, David asked uh, if you could expand, anything you could expand on that would be appreciated. Well, at this point, let's just, let's just say that uh, uh, our exploration and evaluation of the, of the marketplace opportunity has a terbium ion as a very key wavelength. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and uh, there are 369 or, or uh, gallium nitride lasers, Fabry Perot's that are available today. But the important factor to keep in mind here is that uh, DBR lasers, semiconductor lasers are really ultimately enabling OEM products. Uh, these are mobile devices, uh, and uh, ones where you uh, can't accept a mainframe type laser. So uh, we see the uh, uh, terbium ion as being a very key factor. We've got it on our roadmap and we have a, a very detailed plan to move that forward. Great, and so is that is that in the same, I'm just gonna ask because some people might be thinking this, uh, is that gonna be in your standard DBR packaging or is there anything else that's gonna be associated with that because it's a tough wavelength? It's a tough wavelength and uh, we don't believe that it is a frequency doubled wavelength uh, that is uh, readily Great. So it'll be a direct, uh, uh, direct product. Okay. Okay, um, we have time frame for one more question. This is a little bit more open-ended, but you know, DBRs have uh, a great track record um, in telecom wavelengths, datacom wavelengths of being extremely reliable and high volume, right? And and you know, how do you see in in you know in in working with you know other markets? You know, I can understand that in spectroscopy and that sort of thing. But in the quantum space, a lot of the volumes right now are probably low for you, right? They're low volume products, yes. And, and, general, and generally, uh, the, uh, the quantum wavelengths are typically research wavelengths. So right. they, they have lower volumes. Where we see the, the uh, higher volumes is in the OEM applications, which we call adjacencies. And I didn't go into that uh, discussion today, but it's the adjacent applications such as Raman spectroscopy, 
terahertz spectroscopy and others that provide are providing more significant volumes today. Right, but as I think for, for the audience here, I think what's important to note as, as some of the quantum, a lot of quantum research is going on, but as quantum starts to, as certain specific quantum technologies start to you know, enable quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communication and atomic clocks, as that starts to get to more of a deployable nature, uh, is that something you know, uh, at higher volumes, you know, once you get into development, is that something that you see is, as, as supporting in the future? Absolutely. It's uh, fundamentally a semiconductor is a scalable product. You make one, you make 10,000 at essentially the same uh, cost to manufacture. And, uh, and clearly, as uh, that's why the, the importance of the down selection and the down selection, I think, is it will be driven by the need to have uh, to move out of the research and laboratory and into real mobile, uh, real fielded solutions. Yeah. That yeah. Require a scalable, uh, uh, cost effective semiconductor. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Celia, let's switch to Scott Vessant Photonics. Hey folks, can you hear me? We can. All right, hang on, slideshow. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, uh, my name is Scott Davis. I'm CEO and co-founder of Vescent. Uh, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about lasers and photonics tools for quantum systems. I got my uh, four plus minutes. It's a little bit like speed dating with customers. Uh, your operative word is speed. So let's just get into it. What are we about as a company? What is Vessen about as an organization? At our core, we manufacture products that enable quantum systems in the photonics laser enabled quantum space. And we've been doing this for quite some time. We've been doing this for about 15 years. When we started 15 years ago, a standard quantum lab was quite complicated. There's a picture of Ketterly's lab from a number of years ago. It's a sea of optics on a optic, vibration isolated optics table with a group of grad students keeping it going. We manufacture systems for, uh, that make that easier. So in the middle is a research and development system. It's a four laser system. Uh, it's dramatically simpler than it used to be. We also manufacture products that enable deployed quantum OEM products. So uh, in, you know, for us, we are about the full laser solution. That means sources, stabilization, and control. It's more than just the laser. We, a lot of our products are JILA and JQI inspired. Uh, we, come, we come out of JILA, a bunch of us. JQI is the Joint Quantum Institute. Things like Libra call laser drivers with you know, sub shot noise, current noise, a PI squared D laser servos and offset phase locks. Jan Hall taught us the importance of that second stage of integral gain. Uh, out of JQI, we, we've commercialized a fast and very quiet piezo servo. All of this know-how across our electronics and our optics products uh, is incorporated into both our laboratory products and our OEM products. And so what do I mean by OEM products? Well, we are, one of the reasons I get up in the morning is I am excited about quantum leaving the lab. Uh, this is, has been a long path for me all the way back from grad school. Uh, we are in, in the beginning and in the middle of that. And so here's an example of a field deployed quantum laser engine that we manufacture. Uh, this has applications for clocks, computers, sensors, and we cram a tremendous amount of functionality into here. And so in this one offering, we've got two lasers, gas reference, beat note detectors, uh, four laser drivers, six temperature controllers, bandwidth, uh, high speed bandwidth. It's a lot. And I will say that when you're looking at it from an actual deployed system, the drivers of swap are not the optics and the lasers. It's everything else that you need to get your photons to do what you need them to do for your quantum application. And we are looking at it from a whole system solution. That's not to say that the optics aren't important. So inside all of this are the optics. So uh, here's the, an example optical core of an OEM module for a quantum laser engine. Uh, this has four stages of isolation, two lasers, a spectro uh, sub Doppler spectroscopy module. It's a whole optics lab in your palm. Uh, I will point out the importance of isolation. 
quantum has frequency requirements that are much, much harder than telecom. It's much more sensitive to optical feedback. This is a big issue. Uh, I will also point out the, the gas cell. This is a big issue. Uh, we manufacture these uh, in our Golden Colorado facility in telecom style micro optics assembly. And these are designed to just work in an OEM situation. So we've got a unit that's been deployed in a clock running continuously for greater than three years. Uh, I, I'm quite proud of that. We also manufacture turnkey frequency combs. Frequency combs are, as folks know, amazing devices. They're amazing, enabling, they're worthy of the recent Nobel Prize. They're used for disciplining multiple lasers, optical clocks, sensing. We now manufacture frequency combs that are truly turnkey, you know, almost like an oscilloscope. You buy it, you turn it on, it locks up, you're ready to go. We have laboratory units. We also have units and versions of units, OEM units that uh, we sell to customers. There's an example of an OEM oscillator that's the heart of the comb. Uh, we've got progress on rad hard versions. Uh, we have oscillators and a dual comb spectroscopy system that was deployed in the field in Oklahoma during a recent deep freeze, and it survived that. It's quite proud of that. We are feeding the quantum supply chain. And so this is across timing, computing, sensing, communicating. Uh, we develop and commercialize technologies that are low swap, easy to use, deployable, volume scalable, and designed for quantum. And we're not standing still. In addition to what I talked about, we also are working on watt level CW lasers from the near IR to near UV, ultra narrow line with lasers that enable deployed quantum clocks, which is coming. Laser systems for quantum are hard, I get that. Uh, we've been doing it for 15 years. Uh, let us manufacture the laser system for us. Uh, give us a call. Here's how to contact us. Like I said, we're in Golden, Colorado, uh, sales at Besant.com. Uh, go to our webpage. We've got a line of international distributors. Folks know how to contact me. That's it, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. So, so Besant has a history, uh, also a very long history, uh, even from the foundings of the company, getting into technologies around enabling quantum, right? Uh, we do indeed. One of our co-founders, the chairman of the board, was as a postdoc. He was the first one that did a Bose-Einstein condensation there at Cornell's lab. Kurt Vogel, our VP of R&D, was instrumental in early frequency combs and uh, early uh, optical clocks. Yeah, it's in our DNA. Yeah. So you and then and so so you 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 started Vessin and you immediately started you know uh, continuing to supply into people doing quantum uh, research. You started you know supplying tools, laser sources. Clock. We we started Vessin for an alternate technology that I was leading. We eventually sold that off, but we needed to make money. We had mortgages to pay. And so we started making products that we know how to make. And those were things like laser servos and laser drivers and stuff we learned how to do in grad school. And it's really grown as an evolution from that. We are very much, I'm back as CEO for a little over a year now, and we're pushing towards manufacturing, OEM applications, getting things out in the field. Uh, it, we're having super fun. So can you go back to your slide where you show uh, that crazy optics table that we see in so many quantum presentations? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, looking at the center picture, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have questions. Well, when is quantum going to get out of the lab, right? Uh, and and so in that middle picture there, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, that's that's Besant moving beyond research and selling into development platforms and ultimately deployed platforms, which you're already starting to do in quantum, right? That, that's right. And so this is a system, it's got four DBR lasers and our DBR lasers are manufactured by Photodyne. They make great chips. Thank you, John and Annie. Uh, four DBR lasers, spectroscopy references uh, for doing lock in your hyperfine transition all the offset locking electronics, uh, all the heterodyne modules. Uh, this is a system that is for uh, an atom interferometer. It'll also be used for, for certain types of clocks, for certain types of sensors. Uh, and the idea is all the drivers and everything are, are included in that, that relatively small system. But you know, this is helping folks, customers develop and fine tune their quantum system. Then we're also working with those customers on figuring out what pieces of this need to be incorporated into an OEM module. That OEM module, then we will sell to them as as these quantum systems leave the lab, which is great. Great, and then and then so given all that, we have time for maybe one quick question, quick answer. Uh, where do you see sort of 
some of the first deployments going beyond what you've been doing so far that Vesson is going to support? I think optical clocks are coming. Uh, I don't think I know optical clocks are coming. Those need combs. Those need uh, sort of quantum spectroscopy level lasers. Uh, we're in the middle of, of manufacturing and providing those. And so, so that's coming in the near term. Uh, I think sensors are interesting. I think, uh, I think computers are still sort of mainframe lab systems, uh, time frame for getting those. As far as I see, most of the quantum computing is a, a services model, so they don't care as much about deployability. I, I think that will change in time, and I want Vesson to be a part of that change. Um, yeah, Great. That, that, that's Great. my- Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's go to uh, Mark Tolbert with Toptica. Afternoon, Mark. Afternoon. Let me get to share here. Got the screen. Yep. Great. First of all, thanks, Celia, Mark, Scott. For inviting us here today. Uh, today, I'd like to walk you through the evolution of some of our quantum related products and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing over the past 25 years for quantum. There we go. First of all, Topic was founded in 1998, and we actually came as a spin off of the quantum optics group. Since that time, we've been constantly growing and meeting the applications in quantum with our laser systems. We've actually expanded to locations across the planet, including what you see here, which is our North American headquarters in Rochester, New York. Worldwide, Toptica is a team of about 380 employees now and growing rapidly, many of which have been directly connected to quantum their entire career. So we actually take pride in offering the broadest wavelength coverage of any laser company on the planet. And as you can see here, that includes our people too. Toptica started enabling quantum in 1998, as I stated before. And as we go through these, this presentation today, pay attention to the uh, skyline of wavelengths to the right of the screen. It all began with the DL100 external cavity diode laser. This laser was designed with cold atoms and ultra cold quantum gases in mind. I'd actually bet the majority of the old school AMO physicists have come across this laser at some point in their career. As we continued to evolve and as the science continued to evolve, we actually drove into what's the DL Pro. The DL Pro is a unique cavity design that drove a high need for digital electronics as well and gave us the line widths and the capability and the stability that was now required for making quantum even more of a success. As the need fell into having the demand for more industrialized and a broader wavelength range, we introduced the DFB Pro. That gave us tunability and stability of what would become a semi-industrialized package. As we moved past into needing more power and when those high power ECDLs were needed for things like, oh, optical lattices, we actually stepped up the power with our TA systems, the tapered amplifier systems that you see here. And we continued to evolve and been catching up with all of the new, new, and atom new atomic species and new lines, for example, Rydberg transitions. And here we can do second and fourth harmonic generation lasers with the extended wavelength ranges that'll actually take it all the way down to just below 200 nanometers or 190 nanometers to be exact. Finally, we all know that quantum is not limited to just atoms. Condensed matter physicists have been pushing quantum boundaries with micro resonators, photonic crystals, quantum dots, et cetera, pushing the boundaries in widely tunable lasers and exploring and utilizing the transition to those systems. So we developed mode hop free lasers with tunabilities of tens of nanometers in a most reliable fashion to make sure that we could give a robustness that's needed. Rounding out the wavelength range to get us up into the IRR, we actually pushed for the molecular species. And there we introduced a PRISM award-winning OPO. The TOPO, as we call it, is the most widely tunable OPO laser in the market. It's great for doing mid-IR molecular spectroscopy and ultra-cold molecular quantum chemistry. Still, keeping the high expectations related to narrow line width and adding tunability across the mid-IR range. 
We didn't stop with just the lasers. When it comes to making experiments a success, we pushed those innovations even further with our, co our combs as well and added the extension modules to give us a true system and really help continue to expand the application capability that was needed for the quantum marketplace. Finally, we get the need that compact lasers and integration becomes a key part of it. And we just talked about the need tied to making this table something that's actually usable. So we overcame this huge challenge with our T-Rack systems. These are fully integrated solutions for the most demanding quantum experiments. They're modular, we can customize them, and we can pull it all into a single package where we get the performance within the rack off of the table. In many cases, we can get them into a 19 inch rack mount systems without, without even needing that table environment. So we've engineered, engineered these systems in terms of noise cancellation, the passive cooling that's needed to make them work as good as our tabletop systems. And actually the innovation doesn't stop. Breaking news this week, we're actually rolling out what we call the DL Pro FL and the TA Pro FL featuring the highest quantum gate fidelities and ion based quantum processors. So if you're building quantum computers, we're doing what we can to try to take the steps to make your build even easier. Showing that again, we are here for quantum because we are quantum. Toptica is here to continue the quantum evolution. Even if you don't see it in a product yet, you can rest assured that we're constantly scanning the quantum horizon to evolve the quantum universe. Whether it's PICs, industrialized packages, or the need for a system integrator, we're confident that Topsky can be ready when the quantum market demands the right solution. So to wrap up, Toptica has been developing high-end lasers for quantum applications for more than 20 years. And we see ourselves at the frontiers of quantum from fundamental research to real world applications and system integration. Toptic has enabled quantum industrialization with hundreds of product developments and the partnerships established over two decades. This way we can leverage this unique experience and network to work with other quantum industries in different ways from giving strategic advice to help mature their technology, collaboration and system integration, and even testing to make sure that we can bring quantum to a commercial state. Thanks for the chat today. If you've got any questions or want to talk to us more about Toptica or quantum, reach out to us. You've got our contact information here. Thanks, Mark. You're muted. Hey, Mark. Sorry, I'm on mute. <laughs> I muted myself. Um, I it was so, <laughs> yeah, so uh, great presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, so Topic has done a fantastic job supplying uh, quantum researchers all the wavelengths and associated uh, cap solution capabilities around um, you know those those laser sources so that they can do their quantum experiments. And you know, I, I think the I think the big question for me and many of us is is so when we start looking at beyond the research market is is if if and what is Topica doing um i realize maybe some of that might be sensitive but where are you going in terms of like supporting outside of the lab you know a little bit more than what you said in the presentation are you are you moving to uh, things that are now going into development are you moving to things that are actually going to get deployed what would, what would you say to that we actually see both, Mark. Uh, if you take a look at the acti activity that we've participated in, if you just look at something with the evolution of the T-Rack system, there you're going more vertically integrated to take more of the components that traditionally we might not have gotten involved with, whether it's mm -hmm. the EOMs, the AOMs, and pulling those into a solution to get them more ready. At the other end of the spectrum, we also focus in on the integration piece. So if you look at programs like OptiClock, IQ Clock, and the flagship programs, We've actually been the system integrator in many cases on those uh, high-end systems where we actually pull together competitors, other government entities, universities to provide an end solution. So what we're trying to do, our strategy has been to make sure that we are as useful to the quantum community as we can be from a commercial standpoint. That's great, that's great. Um, have you ever partnered with other laser companies? We have. Yeah, there's, a, there's been a number of uh, uh, applications where we've partnered with companies like MPB and others 
Uh, we're always looking for new application development to help further uh, semiconductor development and so on. So short answer is yes. Okay. And a quick question from, uh, you know, Santanu from Corning asked, uh, you know, what, uh, what is sort of the remaining challenges in cost and size and new wavelengths? What do you see as remaining risks? It's the answers that we're waiting from you, Mark. It's the market. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm the market maker. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it, it really is driven by that, though, because so many of these things are, uh, they're less of a physics problem and more of an engineering and market problem right now. So you saw that in Scott's talk, too. I'm getting something into an industrialized package. Uh, sorry, my, I've got one in my hand, too. It's not the hard part. It's really getting the market that drives it. John mentioned there's over a hundred wavelength choices. So the consolidation of getting that down so that we get something that has a useful market space to allow us to do the investment that makes sense for it. I mean, uh, you're speaking to the converted. I mean, I, I it's it's a 100% economics problem, you yeah. know, it, it, for all the laser companies. I used to build and sell lasers too. I know I, I know it too well. Great, thank you so, uh, so much. Uh, let's move on to Freedom Photonics. Stephen. Good to go. Can't hear you. We can see Here we go. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, we yeah. can hear you now. All good. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Um, so I'll st start again. My name is uh, Steven Estrella. I'm from Freedom Photonics. I am the uh, quantum technology and applications uh, technical leader. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some of our technology that we've been developing uh, specifically for uh, quantum applications. Great. Can you put it in presentation mode? Let's see. Yeah, great. Thank Got you. That. Got all mixed up here. You're good now. All right. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, uh, we're a small business in Santa Barbara, California, uh, and we are a unique uh, and innovative manufacturer of photonic components and modules and subsystems, and we're addressing everything from chips all the way up to uh, subsystems. And given our broad capabilities, uh, we can provide uh, a lot of these things, and that makes us uh, very unique, being the size that we are. And we also work in a variety of material platforms, uh, particularly in group 3.5. This would be indium phosphide and gallium arsenide. We also work in group 4 materials. This would also include silicon photonics and the hybrid integration, uh, integrated solutions thereof. And while most of our uh, traditional product offerings have been more in the classical space, we, uh, we have many ongoing projects uh, specifically in the quantum sensing, communication, and networking uh, areas. And uh, just to give you an example of uh, what we have been doing uh, uh, for the many years that we've been in business, uh, there are some examples here shown below going from uh, chips on the left all the way up to uh, modules uh, on the right. And although we may be a small company, uh, our uh, core expertise spans all areas of the photonic <coughs> development uh, uh, cycle. Um, an example is kind of shown here. We go all the way from design and fabrication to test and packaging and even manufacturing and subsystems. We have uh, over 21,000 square feet uh, of our facilities and multiple 10,000 uh, class 10,000 clean rooms where we house uh, all of this uh, uh, fine equipment. And of course, none of this will be possible without having an excellent team. We have over uh, 50 employees with uh, deep know-how and expertise uh, that produce all of these great products for us. So in terms of uh, products, we have many uh, off-the-shelf uh, components. These would be primarily in the areas of tunable lasers. We have centers from 1250 all the way up to 1750 nanometers. We also offer uh, high-power DFE lasers at 1280 and 1550 nanometers. These have greater than 400 milliwatt output power uh, less than 300 kilohertz line width and uh, also record high wall plug efficiency. We can also produce uh, single spatial mode lasers exceeding one watt. And some of those are kind of shown on the bottom left. 
Uh, and in terms of uh, private label products, uh, we have done this for a variety of different customers, uh, all the way from custom lasers to photonic integrated circuits, and also advanced uh, micro optic solutions. And some of those are shown here on the uh, bottom right. So specifically uh, into the areas of atomic sensing, we are active uh, in producing uh, lasers around the 7xx or 8xx nanometer range, particularly for rubidium and cesium. Uh, some of these uh, lines have already been discussed. Um, but here I'm showing a specific example of our 780 and 795 nanometer DFB laser technology. These have uh, integrated semiconductor optical amplifiers and we've demonstrated mode hop free tuning uh, here in this case over a 50 degree C uh, temperature range for various laser and amplifier operating points. Uh, it's worth mentioning this kind of performance is uh, rather difficult to achieve, uh, but it speaks to our expertise in laser design, fabrication uh, and packaging. And lastly, I'll just touch on that uh, we also provide uh, control electronics. Uh, these include uh, low noise drivers, uh, temperature control, active wavelength locking, and, and we've even produced very compact modules where we've co-packaged the photonic devices, micro optics, and even the laser control electronics all within a package about the size of the quarter, and that's shown up here on the right. Uh, so as you can really see, we, we uh, fulfill uh, the full entire range of photonic development all the way from chips all the way up to very advanced uh, modules and we're quite proud of the, the work that we've done there. And so I would just say thank you for listening and feel free to uh, either visit our website or contact us directly and see how we can help you. Uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I know this, this, this presentation was, you know, in this webinar is focused a lot on, you know, basically focused on the lasers enabling quantum, but right with the laser and you guys are sort of known um, for doing photonic integrated circuits, right? Correct. Yeah, and, and that's, that's sort, uh, of, sort of, well, I'm just saying it's sort of part and parcel. I'm hearing constantly on the, you know, developing the laser prioritization tool that, you know, so many of these quantum applications need the laser, but they also need the pick, right? Um, right. And, and so, you know, the question I have for you on the picks um, is, is uh, you know, what type of pick optical functions do you provide today? So we have a variety of uh, active platforms. Um, and I, what I really touched on today were mainly sort of specific to lasers, but I also touched um, previously, if I go back a little bit, uh, yeah. to some of our existing DFB lasers that also integrate uh, optical amplifiers. Now, yep. uh, power is obviously a concern and so is stability, um, but we also can use these uh, as a shutter or as a variable optical attenuator, and these can be operated quite fast. So not only do we have the ability to amplify the light, but obviously we can extinguish it, turn it off. And those are very basic functions, um, but we do have other platforms uh, where you've integrated um, modulators, for instance, uh, and also sort of integrated uh, detectors. Um, I haven't showed any of that here, but uh, we have yeah. done plenty of that work sort of in the past. Right, and I think it's extremely important for the audience here because uh, you know, you, so you supply lasers like DFB lasers, et cetera, but you also supply the PIC and the semiconductor optical amplifier all in the same little package? Correct. Uh, and, and not just in the same package, but in this case, in this example, this is one, in a, this, this is a photonic integrated circuit. And so if you could zoom in basically to that package that's kind of shown up here in the upper right hand corner, you would see that it's just sort of the, the basics of uh, temperature control and lensing for getting light in and out. Um, but all the key functionality is, is really contained within one um, pick. Awesome, awesome. So uh, this is a very open-ended question, uh, but you know, so let's say you're a quantum solutions company and you know, you need a laser source and a pick or semiconductor amplifier and a, and a, and a laser source, you know, what sort of uh, commercial step, you know, do, do, you know, what kind of threshold needs to be, you know, beaten so that you'll, you know, so Freedom Photonics would take something like that on, right? You know, to justify a purpose-built pick or a purpose-built laser with a, with a uh, semiconductor optical amplifier, for example. What, what could you say around those lines? 
Well, uh, I think more importantly, is sort of just developing sort of the enabling platform. And so already we've kind of done that here for say 780, um, but this is easily tailored to other wavelengths that are even close by sort of maybe around uh, 850 or, or such. Um, and so really for us, I believe, you know, the need has to be there, obviously. Um, yeah, right. But we have, you know, the deep expertise and know-how to, to do the photonic integrated circuits. And we routinely do this even at 1550. So really, we're taking advantage of our sort of expertise and track record, addressing sort of the larger markets within sort of datacom and communications and such. And we're applying those same principles to address uh, devices that are more required for quantum. But obviously that is that is a jump and the market pool has to also be there, but we're ready to do that when the when there is the, the correct need to do so. So if you have a need, then, you know, we'd like, we love to chat. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. That was very helpful. Um, Celia, I think it's back to you. And then, you know, if we have time after your outro, maybe there's, there we have a few more questions to address. Okay. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to all the presenters. I just wanted to um, share with everyone. I, I, I'm very pleased with, um, with this event and looking forward to additional ones on other topics. So the next planned quantum marketplace webinar is on June 24th at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's gonna focus on quantum sensors. And so I hope you'll mark your calendars and look forward to seeing you there. The one in July, um, currently scheduled on July 27, is on cryogenic technologies. Uh, we'd love to hear from you on technologies that you would like to know more about. Uh, and if you're a QEDC member and you'd like to provide uh, a showcase of your company and what its capabilities are, uh, reach out to me or Mary Scott or Crystal Bouvereau and let us know. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark. Um, and we understand if people have to jump off at the top of the hour, but we can uh, stay on a little while and, and have an informal conversation with our presenters, uh, perhaps, and look forward to seeing you all at future Quantum Marketplace webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. So uh, let's go back a little bit. Uh, maybe some of these can be taken offline to uh, but Marco from Coherent asked a question. I don't know if he's still here, um, but uh, you know he asked a question of Scott. I don't know, Scott, did you see it on slide five? I did five? see it. I, I responded to him in the chat. I'm happy to, to uh, he asked about in our, our little micro optics package, what all is in there. And uh, it's, we, we, we try to cram a, a lot in there, but not more than you need. And so in, in that one example for the one customer, it's got two DBR lasers, four stages of isolators. Uh, it's got a <clears throat> spectroscopy cell for doing the subdoppler hyperfine, heterodyne optics, heterodyne bead note detector. Uh, and so the idea is you lock one of the lasers to a hyperfine transition. You offset phase lock the other laser to that. Then you're controlling your quantum laser with RF technology, sort of similar to cell phone technology. So you're controlling lasers with cell phone technologies. And we, we're, we're a big fan of offset phase locks. It gets rid of the need for EOMs or AOMs. And so for deployed systems, we, we like them a lot. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and then we had a, a broader question um, to the panel. I don't know if everybody's seen this. Um, this is obviously going to be probably different companies are going to have different perspective, but at least for the five presenters today, you know, the, the question was, I'll reread it, which is, you know, um, how would you, you know, characterize the present state of technology and standards in laser device industry, both for industry devices themselves and for component parts of the laser device? So A, non-existent, still in the wild, wild west, B, formative standards groups forming, uh, C, active working groups actively constructing standard documents. D, mature, well-established standards throughout. Well, I think obviously D is off the table. We're not there yet. <laughs> so it's probably, you know, depending, I'm, I'm going to make a comment first that, you know, uh, I think it's depending on which area you're in, uh, you know, quantum timing, uh, quantum sensing, quantum communication, or quantum computing, and depending on which technology horse you, you're betting on, uh, I think it's a combination of A, B, and C, but, you know, Scott, why don't you go first? I agree. It's a combination of A, B, and C. You know, it's still so uh, nascent. You know, folks are still figuring this stuff out. Uh, I think, um, you know, uh, 
John Spencer had mentioned the greater than 100 wavelengths. You know this well. You're working on this laser prioritization tool, which I think all of the suppliers are sort of eagerly waiting for the results of that. Uh, no pressure, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a lot of good stuff is happening, right? So even in, in the preparation of this, you know, with dry runs and everything else with this webinar, you know, already seeing that certain customers could be connected with certain laser companies. They weren't even aware that they had this technology. So, you know, I, I think it's it's all moving in the right direction. A little bit more complicated, I thought, than I think it was originally, but it's all good. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're moving. And, you know, I love events like this. I love, as Celia said at the beginning, it's connecting dots. Uh, this is, you know, I really do believe in the rising tide lifts all boats. And I know that some of us are, are competing out there and I think competition is healthy. So I'm curious what other folks think about these questions. I'm gonna yeah, shut I up think, now. I think we're right. I mean, we're in, we're in all phases of evolution right now. And even, even those that are viewed as being leaders in the market right now, having made their choices are still looking at other options across the board. And that's before you even get it. That's just on the laser. That's before you get into the rest of the system integration and everything that comes from that. So I think I've, I've often wondered, having gone through telecom, and I think many of us here have, we were fairly fortunate with telco that we got we got what we got because it's what was available. What would have happened if that were, were quantum, right? It would it be impossible or would we have made some other choices related to it? So in some cases, and that's that's what we're all doing. We're taking some bets on technology as to what we think we can do. So same thing. I mean, we love we love seeing the competition, the competitive factor of it, because we all learn some, something from it and everybody's bringing something different to the table too, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Stephen, why don't you take a crack at what you think on that? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would echo that it is kind of a mix. Uh, but fortunately, we do, as already mentioned by Mark, have, you know, standard telecommunications like Telcordia standards that we kind of work from, that's kind of a, a good guiding, you know, framework. Um, but we're also experiencing this even in, even in the aerospace industry where uh, depending where these photonic devices go, they have even different requirements. And so there, I think it is even a little bit less certain, but there are active bodies uh, working on uh, standards for that. And as we go, I think even deeper down into the sort of the quantum uh, regime, uh, you know, I think it becomes even less clear sort of uh, what, what the real requirements are because we're just finding what those applications are. And I think there have been, you know, maybe few units that have been fielded. So I think it's very much dependent on where are these going to go? What is the outlook? Uh, but I think we do have a lot uh, to sort of rely on from, you know, what uh, we stand on the shoulders of, of telecommunications uh, for at least giving us some guidance, but for more guidance actually would be even better. Yeah, great. Thank you. And then, and then, Dirk, you wanna you wanna add your perspective? Yeah, actually, um, maybe as a side comment, I'm most excited about what the future can bring through photonic integrated circuits. So I think that will be a, a, a huge step once the industry transitions to utilizing more photonic integrated circuits in Swap C. Uh, it, I think, it will enable a lot more devices, but. But that's also quite a path yet. I think we're still in this phase where let's cover all the wavelengths and let's make sure it's all stable. And we haven't really tackled the large volume questions and very low cost questions yet. And that's right. going to be pretty exciting. Right, right. And then John Spencer, would you like to add something and wrap it up? Yes, I'd like to make a few points. One is uh, there are disciplines in the or, or guideposts within what the uh, products need to be, and that is the physics wavelength. You've got those term diagrams, and by golly, if you're going to make a clock, you need 780 or 852 or 369. And I think that as we mature, those issues of, of uh, scalability, reliability, reliability is a huge issue. Uh, there was a, a chat about how it looked like all the wavelengths had been developed. But uh, there's a huge gap between where we are now and uh, what needs to be done before you have real products. So I would say uh, down selection of the wavelengths, and I gave you my opinions, uh, and I think it's uh, lifetime and reliability is going to be the, the big challenges for the future. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, we have. Um... 
We have another question, um, and it, it's interesting. So this person's asking about, um, it's Peter Feldman is asking, you know, you know, for the panelists, you know, comment on quantum memory research for quantum repeaters. Uh, as we know, at least what my understanding is, is that, is that, you know, there's quantum communication inside of like, say 60 kilometers, where you don't really need quantum memory, but once you start going beyond 60 kilometers, you've got to regenerate the, the entanglement or whatever or wherever your technique is, because you can't just go through a, you know, an, a pump or an EFA pump or whatever. Um, so you need quantum memory. Um, you know, is anybody here on the panel feel they have domain expertise to talk about that? Uh, I'll, I'll just chime in briefly. Uh, like much of quantum, uh, there are lots of different ways of doing quantum memory, and those require a full spectrum of wavelengths. Uh, we sell into one company that is doing one approach. Uh, I'm pretty sure Toptica sells into companies doing approaches as well. Um, uh, some of them are in the, the telecom wavelength. Some of them are in the near infrared. There's, there's a whole spectrum, and I think the jury's still out on which one's going to win, if any of them. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, we see that too. And I actually, I sat on the board with QNECT, which is a memory company focused on that. So there's a number of different solutions that are coming. We're here to give them the tools to try to develop what they can do and, and see where we can help with more vertical integration. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Dirk, John, Stephen? I don't have anything smart to say about quantum repeaters. <laughs> it's such a broad and very, very young field yet, so. Yeah, it's very early, right? I'm, I'm consistently hearing that. That's probably category A still. Mark, I'd like to actually jump in and um, yeah. I'm going to head out and maybe others do too, but um, some of this conversation is um, making me think about the project that you're working on with QEDC to develop a tool to help prioritize what the most uh, promising areas for development might be. And so I just right. want to kind of give a teaser to everybody who's still on the call to let you know that uh, we're creating what we're calling a prioritization tool that's intended to take into consideration the requirements, the readiness levels today, how hard it is to get where it needs to be, and uh, markets, both the actual quantum markets, but also adjacent markets. And a lot of that is, is challenging to um, put a number on, and it'll be a kind of updated tool going forward, but we think it's going to be very useful for understanding the landscape better, and stay tuned for more. Thank you, Celia. I, th I, think, I think we're done, unless we want to keep okay. talking. No, this is great. <laughs> thanks, Mark, and thanks to all the presenters. It's been a great yeah, Thank you to all the presenters. Fantastic job.